God bless each and every one of you this morning. We'll just bow our heads for a quick word of prayer as we thank the Lord for his loving kindness. Father, as we come before you now, we just thank you for your mercy and your grace. We pray that it be with us today for each and every person who's come to learn of your word. Father, for those that are making their way here in their travels, Father, Lord, just be with us every step of the way. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray all these things. Amen. 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 Well, thank the Lord. And God bless uh, all those, that, again, that are gathered together. We've been talking a little bit about God's mercy and the, for the pulpit service and, and coming up here after following song service and so forth. Uh, we'll have part two of Mercy Forever, but talking about God's mercy, just figured I'd take that this little bit of time we have in Sunday school and to speak a little more about that subject. We all have need of awareness, obviously. It'll, it'll dovetail right into uh, our service topic this morning. In uh, some scriptures, of course, when you think about mercy or God's kindness or his benevolence, his grace toward us, there are so many scriptures contained within the pages of our Bible that deal with that subject in one way or another. They all deal with it in a, in a very general sense. God's mercy is as life itself is evidence of God's mercy. It's merciful. It pulled, in the beginning, it pulled awareness out of nothing. That, that's God's mercy at work because now we are no longer just a part of a thought process, but we have actual life. And he, as he has called us out of the darkness of non-existence into his glorious light. So just for, to title this, we'll just call it mercy. It's not a part as in the series that we're having from the pulpit, but it's certainly intended to it. So we'll just call it mercy, just the, the one word. As we were in the, before creation, what we were was potential. I mean, God thought he conceived of the human race and what it would take to bring it all about. And as a result of all those things, through the thought process of the almighty God that we're told about, his wisdom that endures forever, even as his mercy does, but his wisdom that endures forever out of Proverbs chapter 8, all that came forth in the design and the plan of the Almighty God, and now we are actual, instead of just merely being thoughts of the Almighty. So life came forth and made it all real, and we're here as a result of that. And in thinking about God's mercy, let's turn to the book of the law, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law, the going over and and getting the foundation set for what was delivered at Mount Sinai. We're going to read in Deuteronomy 15, a few verses here. We'll start at verse 7. And uh, Deuteronomy literally means second law. It's going over the tenets of the law again uh, and putting them into a finished state, especially for the second generation and even third generation of the Exodus as uh, for 40 years they wandered, and many of them did not make it into the promised land, but their children did, and their grandchildren. So we thank the Lord. His word gets you there. That's always evidence of that, wherever it is that we are going. You know, here in our exodus, so to speak, from as we wander through this world, being strangers and pilgrims, you know, we within our church, within Pine Creek, you know, we held to this that, you know, at some point God's going to do something great and bring something out of all the things that are going forth, you know, and we slugged it out alone on our own for uh, a lot of years, but believing there would be a point where people would come out, a certain people would come out and see that the way that things were transpiring uh, was just not the way to go and that God's revealing nature is ongoing, and we have evidence of that now. And uh, so we thank the Lord for those things. We always believed in it. We always hoped in it. We always stuck to it. And thank the Lord, you know, just with a little faith, mighty things can come out of that. So we're looking for good things to come forward as we know that all the good things that are contained within Scripture, they provide foundation for us. Even even the, those, the laws that were 
given to Moses and all the speakings thereof, which we're going to access right now here in Deuteronomy chapter 15. And just uh, keep in mind, of course, our subject is mercy. And some of the earlier verses of the chapter talk about uh, what we would call servitude, indentured servitude, and so forth. Uh, and, and the promise was after seven years to make a release and creditors, the debts would be forgiven in the seven year period and so forth. Uh, these rules were highly adaptive to the society and the, and the way things were and the customs of the people and the Lord adapted it to, to fit them at that time. But there's mercy written into these laws, including uh, that which uh, forgives debts which are contained in the earlier verses, and then that leads down to verse 7, which says, If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren, within any of thy gates in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need, in that which he wanteth, and, or in other words, in that which he lacks, not just every fleshly desire that would come along, but being in a state of want. All right, so that's God's mercy built within the laws given to Moses. And then we continue from there, from verse 9. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand. As according to the earlier scriptures, you can go back and look at them, more closely, but not to withhold kindness, just saying, well, the seventh year is coming up there. They, you know, they have a real get out of jail free card, so to speak, uh, coming up, not to be of, of that type of mind, but to do what you should when you should do it. All right, so the seventh year of release is at hand. And thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Because anything that doesn't proceed from faith and love, what is that? It's sin. Any, any unbelief gets you into the depths of sin. So don't harden uh, one's heart against that. Verse 10, thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him. Because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. So in whatever state we come to, uh, we have to show God's mercy. And what does God do when we give of ourselves unto others or applies for the offering, he blesses us in the way. Uh, the way to get something that's of spiritual worth is to give something that is of spiritual worth. And of course, these are, uh, faith needs to have actuality to it. It has to move. It has to show itself by uh, doing as according to the word of the Lord. So when Jesus said, as you recall the saying in the New Testament, when Jesus said, the poor you have with you always, in his sayings he wasn't being pessimistic, he was actually quoting scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. For, for it says here, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. Uh, within all the things that have purpose under the heavens, uh, some people have one. Now, we're very fortunate. I don't know if we realize full, I don't know if I realize how fortunate I am you know, to live at the level that we have. We, our circumstances are different than theirs, but nonetheless, these, mercy always applies wherever it is that we go, and we have to keep that in hearts and minds. You know, uh, I, in, in thinking, you know, there's a, a, a shortage of products on shelves right now, and you've probably seen the film of tankers off the ports in, yeah. on the West Coast and the East Coast and so forth, you know, and my goodness, you know, because it all has to do with commerce and what if we don't have enough presents, you know, at Christmas time and stuff, uh, stuff like this, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, there, there, are, there are people living in destitute situations around the world, you know, that they're not thinking about what ships come into port so we can have, have enough on our shelves so we have enough to give. But, you know, they're just trying to uh, get by through an existence. So uh, we should always be appreciative of what we have in, in Christ, you know. 
and be ready uh, to do our part. And fortunately, you know, we have been able to give some of our money to uh, overseas to people where it has done some real good, and we will continue to do that as we go, as the avenues opened up for us to do that. So we thank the Lord uh, for these things. So uh, out of all these things, all the things that we speak about, if we did not have these circumstances, how would our character ever be formed? How would God find out who we are within our spirit? So all these things come about. So there will always be an element of poor and how, and how they adapt and, and how we adapt uh, to them. It shows what's within our spirit. But the heart of the Almighty is always displayed here by his command. Nor would the, the servant go away uh, empty-handed after the time period they had to serve, which is verse 12, you know, if we took a, a longer study. You have to do these things. You know, there, one of the most curious events in, in Scripture is Abraham and taking Isaac up on the mount. It's been a subject of study for within Old Testament faith and within Christian faith, you know, for lo these many years. But as good as Abraham was, according to the status of his day and, and what he did, I think that he got himself into trouble there and had to endure the taking of Isaac up the mountain and all that went through it, even though he went by faith and he, know he, had, he knew he had a promise and all those things. But what he did do was send Hagar and Ishmael away, more or less empty-handed, even though he was a man of substance. We have to learn of these things. And, you know, according to the status of the time and the social press pressure he was under and all those things, I think his judgment in that matter was lacking. Even Job needed his judgment yeah. rearranged in his sufferings, even though he was the best person on the face of the earth. So we all have need of the Lord. We all have need to learn, yeah. which do that doesn't cancel out anything that Abraham was and all the good things, because in his place and according to the time that he lived in and the and the social, <clears throat> excuse me, the social structure of the day. It's hard to move outside of that when you're born and raised in that culture and to realize things to a fuller degree. So he went uh, through a lot, but it's in order to show us things as well. So mercy here within these scriptures were ordained, those things were ordained by law. And the blessing comes in thereby, because what did Jesus say? He said, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the yeah. kingdom Amen. of heaven. Blessed are the poor in heart who are just of a, a humble spirit. Because whatever we do have, it belongs to the Lord. It's, it's all his. We don't have anything that is really ours. Uh, we have what the Lord has given us. So we have to bless other people thereby. In Psalms chapter 41, let's read from the book of the songs of praise from Psalms chapter 41, a few verses uh, to read here as we thank the Lord for all that he is to us, which is just everything. So thank the Lord for charitable works. You have to have those things. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that love of the Lord and love of one another and Christian charity is, is the greatest thing and it's greater than all the other things combined, but with those things set in place, you can get anywhere in Jesus' name. Here in Psalms 31, or 41, excuse me, <clears throat> Psalms 41, from the first verse we read this, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. Which goes accordingly to what was written into the law of Moses. It was a very humane, it was very equitable way to treat, treat people, according to the society, the way things had developed at that time, it was way beyond what anyone else was doing. These principles would evolve over the years. Eventually, they come down to us here and into the New Testament dispensation uh, through the, the giving of God's mercy and the presence of himself. So if you consider these things, the Lord will deliver that person in time of trouble. We get benefits Maybe we don't always realize they are benefits right in the moment, but they are. They are. They're very actual. And verse 2 continues on. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. 
The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. You'll be his comfort. Get him through anything that the person he or she goes through. Uh, in, including these things, even when it comes to the personal things, Christ endured so much as we do, including being betrayed here in Psalms chapter 41 in the ninth verse. It was mine own familiar friend who I trusted, who did eat of my bread and he's lifted up his heel against me, which that's the life of Christ given a thousand years in advance. Through David's experience, David had his uh, betrayal also, one whom he had trusted. You can read about it in Psalms 55. As Jesus had Judas, uh, David had Ahithophel, who advised him when Absalom revolted, you know, the, a revolt within his own house and so forth. So uh, these things, uh, the foundations that we find in Scripture, they're always reflective of the life of Christ. Each and every verse speaks to either the attributes of Christ or sometimes very directly to the experience that Christ would suffer, as Psalms 22 is. It shows Christ upon the cross, and Jesus would quote that in that, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, which is how Psalms 22 starts there at verse 1. So within, within all these things, within all the experience that you have, with all that you go through, and some will go through more than others depending on circumstance and chance and decisions and so forth, David, he pleads for the same mercy that he asks of in verse 4, for it says then, I said, Lord, be merciful unto me, heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. And of course, David's transgressions are well noted within scripture. He was always aware of them. So he's pleading for mercy, even though he wasn't poor in the, the dictionary definition of the term poor himself, uh, being king, but he had humble beginnings. He knew what it was like to uh, rise up from just uh, being a, a mere shepherd boy and the last of the uh, the sons, not a, you know, the firstborn or anything like that. So he needed mercy. He needed mercy being king because that was like if we compare it to our own day and age, it's kind of like being president with 12 political parties because uh, in David's time there were the 12 tribes of Israel and they all had their tribal politics because of their family name and their own interests and the and the parts of Israel that they inherited and so forth. So it's kind of like being president. Of course, in his case, he wasn't an elected official, except by the Lord and anointed by Samuel. But he was a president with, in effect, 12 political parties. Now, look at what a mess we are with two major political parties and how, how we get pitted one against another in our own political system, which even though I criticize it at times, I'm still glad for it because I don't want anarchy where it's just, you know, where there's no rule of law anywhere. So we derive a lot of good out of democracy. But look at how politics can divide people so much with two main political parties. Uh, think of what it would be like if there were 12 main political parties, which is kind of like it was uh, then. And in some governments of the world, some democracies like modern Israel has more than that. You know, they have about 50 political parties uh, there and they have to form governments by parties cooperating with one another and so forth. So, uh, so we're thankful for what we have, but we have to realize also that what we really need is a king. Yeah. You know, I'm fond of saying I am a monarchist. Right. Uh, I believe in a king. but. Uh -huh. But that doesn't come by ballot box, or, and it doesn't come by revolution of physical means. It, it will only come when the Lord splits the eastern sky. That's the only way. So, so to be a part of it, we just have to keep our appointment of faith, and faith that works by love. While we're here in Psalms, just the preceding chapter, as a matter of fact, it's the last two verses of Psalms 40, which lead in and provide a uh, Good, a good uh, uh, backdrop to what we read in Psalms 41. Let's read Psalms chapter 40, verses 16 and 17, which says, Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, 
the Lord be magnified. And even within that, it all speaks of Christ, and I believe it, it's got further prophetic content to it, which we'll read here in a moment. And it says this at verse 17, but I am poor and needy. Now again, David, he was king. So uh, all the commerce, it all funneled into the royal house and so forth. So he wasn't poor in, in the sense that uh, he had to beg bread or anything like that. But within his spirit, he realized who he was. He had awareness of it, even though he was at the top of the chain of command. That also meant he was also the subject of the most criticism. And that was Israel's decision. They had wanted a king, and thus they got Saul and then from the house of Benjamin. And then uh, following Saul, who was removed from the kingship, uh, the kingship came to the tribe of Judah through David in order to fulfill scripture, ultimately. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O oh my God. Be quick with me. You know, come to my deliverance in a hurry. So uh, faith realizes the true state of need, which goes beyond the status of worldly riches. And David realized that fully, because some of the poorest people in the world are the ones that have the most money. Who don't, they're like Laodicea. Because what's the state and age of Laodicea like? Uh, it's rich and in, it says it's rich and increased with good, with goods. It has need of nothing. So uh, yet like like this, like this age, many have that idea which uh, leads to those. And they don't know that they're blind, poor, wretched, miserable, naked, and spiritually destitute. So we aim to be the, uh, live on God's word and be aware of things. And David had caused himself to be aware of all these things. As his prayer acknowledged both fault and need. So when we pray, we have fault, we have need. We take it to the Lord in prayer. Let's look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, to magnify the Lord, you need awareness of, of who you are and your status as part of the faithful, but Luke chapter 1, as this will be uh, the one prayer and the giving of glory from one Mary, wife to Joseph, who within her prayer did anything but make herself out to be a deity as we'll see here that Mary will magnify the Lord's name not her own being thankful for the blessings and here at verse 46 we read and Mary said my soul doth magnify the Lord yeah. every prayer has to go that way uh, you can't you know uh, because in, in this day and age because Mary has been elevated to a status in, in other religious circles, uh, which she would utterly reject were she here to do that and by physical presence. Uh, thank the Lord she had this mindset, my soul is magnify the Lord. Praise his name. And so we do that. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Did she need a Savior like everybody else? Most certainly did. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, or blessed, uh, because of the, she was an instrument of God's mercy, and that will show within these scriptures. For that, for he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. See, prayer has awareness of its status. He's looked upon one who is of low degree. He's had mercy upon me. And it's thankful for that. He gives all, all the praise to God, magnifies his name. Because he has done this, he hath filled, at verse 53, he hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath holpen his servant Israel, he has helped us, uh, the King James Version of our word to, to help us. He has holpen his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. What gave her quality? 
that God could use her. She loved salvation. Uh, she didn't walk three feet above the ground. She didn't have a halo around her head. Uh, I've known people who are uh, modern equivalents. Now, uh, biblical people, we give them such reverence and respect for the witnesses they held and so forth. Uh, within, you know, they tend to become a little bit larger than life. But the truth is, they're just like us. Just absolutely like us. So when we walk with the Lord in the light of his way, uh, we're fellow heirs of the promise together. Whether we lived in the ancient day or whether we live in this, this modern time, the, the thing that gave her quality was she loved salvation, which was what we read out of Psalms chapter 40 and verse 16. So there's a reluctance perhaps to read these words, uh, much in the same way we might find a hesitant, a hesitancy to quote Psalms 91 and verse 11 and 12, which are the scriptures that uh, the devil used to tempt Jesus in Luke chapter 4 verses 10 and 11. But when we magnify God's name I mean, by the quoting of these scriptures or the quoting of any other scriptures and not our own voice, we bring every good and great and precious thing into our life. And what's the central topic of the prayer of the magnifying of the Lord that's given within? The central thing is God's mercy as we read it out of scripture. That's what we avail ourselves of through the name and through the faith of Jesus. Through these foundation scriptures, we live in mercy, we love mercy, we practice it as much as we can in this earth, we, be, uh, we make ourselves aware of it, talk about these things so that uh, they don't become mere words, but we can put them into actual practice and do those things yeah. as according to the will of the Lord and magnify his holy name. Amen. So uh, upon that thought, let's just bow our heads and pray. We thank you, Lord, that your word has come to pass. It has showed itself mightily through your servants, even you, dear Lord. You came to be a servant to, for all those who fear your holy name. We just thank you, Father, for your abundant kindness, for your benevolence and your mercy. Let it just be upon the children of God this day. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. God bless each and every one that's come to receive of the Lord this day. You may Amen. stand at this time. You need to be remain seated, whatever you do, whether you stand up, 
whether you remain seated, amen, all of us do it in the name of the Lord. And just thank the Lord for his eternal presence. Thank the Lord that he's with us this day. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So we just bless the name of the Lord and just carry onward. And we're thanking the Lord through prayer for praying for those that are traveling. Brother uh, Kevin, Sister Denise, they're uh, traveling and making their way home. Brother Joe got home safely, obviously, been out in yeah. Arizona. <laughs> Amen. Thank yeah. the Lord that he's here with us today. So we just thank the Lord for all the blessings that he gives to us. Remember in your prayers and in, in your heart, just keep Sister Rhonda and family yeah. in mind, along with Brother Wayne there. After uh, Sister Rhonda's mother had passed uh, away, uh, thank the Lord for God's mercy and that she was able to uh, depart from this life and move onward in a, in a dignified manner. So I know that was a blessing to Sister Rhonda, even amidst the sorrow of the loss. But I know she appreciates your prayers. So. Uh, in, in that manner, we just, uh, once again, just like in Sunday school, it's always a point. We magnify the name of the Lord together. So, and we're thankful also for uh, Sister Sherry, Sister Verva. We thank the Lord that they're be coming back to Oregon here soon. I believe it's this week. Uh, it's been a long time since they've uh, had to be in, you know, transfer to the other facilities. So. We just uh, pray that that goes smoothly. Uh, remembering Brother Vernon also in uh, living in assisted living facility there. And uh, for all things, uh, we just give Lord all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna pray out, thank the Lord. After prayer, we're gonna sing because he lives, amen. As we bow our heads and pray, we thank the Lord. Father, we thank you this day for all the things that you've granted us, Father God, for your mercy, for your loving kindness, Father. We just pray that it, it just sheds its grace upon yeah. us this day, Father. Yeah. Keep us in the cleft of the rock. Shadow us under your wings in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for all your mighty blessings. And we thank you for the peace that passes all understanding within you, Sister Rhonda's family and in the aftermath of the loss. Father, we just thank you, dear Lord, that you're with us. Lo, I am with you even unto the end. And for those that are traveling, those that are in need, and all the circumstances of life that we come into, we know that there's a purpose to all these Amen. things and a time Jesus to it Christ. with everything that occurs under the heavens. Yes. So, Father, we just thank you that whether we pick up or whether we cast away, whether we embrace or refrain from embracing, that, Lord, Lord you're yeah. there with us to meet every need, Father, and be the healer and the teacher Jesus and the Christ. preacher and the author of our salvation that the scriptures tell us of. So, Father, we just bless your holy name, give you all the glory and honor. We magnify your name together in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. amen and amen. The thank Lord. the Lord. Amen. Well, thank the Lord because he lives. Yeah. Sisters. Thank you, Jesus.
Let's just sing, Sweet Jesus, what a wonder you are. Amen. Amen. Thanking the Lord always, indeed. Because he lives, we're with him. Yeah, we live forever. Good. Sweet Jesus. sufferings of this world yeah. are not worthy to be compared That's to right. the glory to be revealed. Right. Let's sing that, shall Amen. we? Amen. I reckon. Well, I reckon. You know I reckon. I say I reckon that the sufferings of it all the time are not worthy. They are not worthy. They are not worthy to be
You know what? If you believe that song, and it isn't just words that go along with a catchy tune, if you got that in your spirit, you're really getting somewhere. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for your holiness. Thank you, Lord, for your praise, your work. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy to us. In Jesus' name. Amen and glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord for Amen. it. Hallelujah. Let's just praise his name Amen. this day by Bless turning the, the service over to Brother Bill and thanking the Lord Hallelujah. for these songs and selections that Thank lift up our heart in Jesus' name. Thank Amen. You. Brother Bill. Praise the name of the Lord. Ooh. Hallelujah. Thank you. God bless Brother Ryan. God bless everyone this morning. Would you rather be somewhere else like fishing or something this morning? <laughs> I'd rather be here. Yeah. Amen. You know, Amen. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we'll be fishers of men. Amen. You get the soul food. Yeah. Amen. Thank the Lord for it. For our first selection, we will sing at Calvary. Oh, Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Sisters, for our next selection, Sister Patty and Sister Rachel will sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer can we find a friend so sisters. God bless you. Amen. For our next selection, Sister Margo, Sister Rachel, and Sister Patty will sing for his mercy endureth forever. Amen. I believe Sister Margo drew inspiration from Psalms 136, which Brother Ryan has preached on a few times here and brought some more revelation to why the scripture is written the way it is, we believe. Amen. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for his mercy endureth forever. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord of lords, for his mercy endureth forever. To him who alone doeth great works, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night. For his mercy endureth forever. To him that smote Egypt in their firstborn. For his mercy endureth forever. And brought out Israel from among them for his mercy endureth forever with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm for his mercy endureth forever to him that divided the red sea into parts for his mercy endureth forever. 
and made Israel to pass through in the midst of it. For his mercy endureth forever, but overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea. For his mercy endureth forever, to him which led his people through the wilderness. For his mercy endureth forever, to him which smote great kings. For his mercy endureth forever, and slew famous kings. For his mercy endureth forever, Zion king of the Amorites, for his mercy endureth forever, and Og, the king of Bashan, for his mercy endureth forever, and gave their land for an heritage. For his mercy endureth forever, even an heritage unto Israel his servant. For his mercy endureth forever, who remembered us in our low estate. For his mercy endureth forever, and hath redeemed us from our enemies for his mercy endureth forever who giveth food to all flesh for his mercy endureth forever oh give thanks unto the god of heaven for his mercy endureth forever for his mercy endureth forever. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you, sisters. And for our next selection, Sister Margo was going to sing, My soul doth magnify the Lord. After I heard it in the Sunday school message, I thought it would be appropriate. Hey. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. He that is mighty hath done to me great things. And holy is his name. His mercy is on them that fear him. And he hath shown them the strength of his arm. He scatters the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Puts down the mighty from their seats. He hath exalted them of low degree, and he hath filled the hungry with good things. The rich he hath sent empty away. He remembers his mercy and truth to Israel and to his seed forever. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. That's right. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Sister Margo. For our last selection, we will sing Mercy. Hallelujah. It's all coming together. 
Amen. I was headed in the wrong direction. My life was filled with fear and unbelief. And war with a sinful nature. Jesus knew exactly what I need. And he had mercy, fullness and love, mercy. From the throne above, mercy took away my sin. Mercy, gave me peace for then. Mercy, opened up my eyes. Mercy, made me realize. Mercy, found me lost in sin. But mercy, gave me life again. I was looking for God's acceptance. I promised to be perfect, but I failed. I didn't understand the problem, but I thought that I could change all by myself. But I took mercy, full of grace and love, mercy, from the throne above, mercy, took away my sin, mercy, gave me peace within, mercy, opened up my eyes, mercy, made me realize, mercy. I'll be lost in sin, and mercy gave me life again. Mercy, open and love, mercy, from the throne above, mercy, took away my sin, mercy, gave me peace within, mercy, opened up my eyes, mercy, made me realize, mercy, I'll be lost in sin, the mercy gave me life again. Mercy took away my sin. Mercy gave me peace within. Mercy gave me life again. It took mercy. Thank you, Lord. And it did take mercy. God's blood shed. Amen. If we'll all stand before Pastor Ryan comes this morning to give us the word of truth, we will sing one of them because we are glad we're one of them. Amen. It's on page 120 in the blue book. Bless the Lord. Oh, my God. 
Jesus' name. As Sister Miriam plays through, let's just bow our heads and seek unto our God. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are a light of salvation unto us, and you've redeemed, you've visited your people by your presence. And through the name of Jesus, Father, we pray that each and every heart will receive of you this day, Father, and just have the joy bells ringing within their spirit, Father, according to your word and for the glory of your name. And as we magnify the name of the Lord together, let that name be highly praised. Let that name be exalted above all other names. The name of Jesus in which we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. Thank the Lord for each and every one. Lifted up their voice in praise. You may be seated. Thank the Lord for the unity of the faith and all those who have come to receive. Thank the Lord who are not just hearers of the word, but indeed doers of his mighty will. So thank the Lord. There's nothing better than to be in, in service to the king. And one day every knee shall have to bow to that fact, whether willing or no, that there is a Lord in heaven. He's coming to rule and reign, and we look forward to that glad millennial day, and it doesn't stop there either. As the multitude of his mercies endure forever, so may the merciful God just be our light that shines around about us this day and ever onward. Let there be peace among us. What a great gift peace is when you have it within your spirit and you have a little bit of it in your life. The world will try to take that away from you. That's for sure. A lot of things we go through in this world. But thank the Lord, God is peace itself. He is life itself. And the greatest gift that we can ever have from above, excuse me, is the peace of knowing that we will ever be with the Lord. That gives a confidence and a hope that never fades away. Is that type of peace? It surpasses even human understanding that uh, relies on its own thought process. It's only assurance of faith and the written word can give you the confidence to know that life is promised to overcome death. 
That's our victory in Jesus' name. It's what we look forward to. And only the knowledge of a risen Savior, that's life raising up out of the tomb, life coming out of the ashes of death, only the knowledge of a risen Lord lifts our faith above this temporary state, the temporal state of our earthly pilgrimage, our day-by-day -day walk, and gets us into a higher realm. And that realm, it's heaven. It's heaven, the place of God's being. It's the invisible to the naked eye now, but oh, it's so very real. Such a very real dwelling place of the everlasting God. And mercy does dwell there, so we're going to speak to that in our subject of mercy forever. The second part, as I have it mapped out here, would be to the to uh, part four as we go along with the pulpit services. And we even threw in a little bit to think about in Sunday school this morning. Called Within mercy, amen. And our song certainly uh, attested to it and praise God's holy name, which I'm very grateful for. Boy, the inspiration that comes and, and lifts up the spirit. Boy, that, that's victory. That's victory. Whatever you've come against you in this life, if you can stand up and sing and still praise God, you're really doing something worth doing. So bless the name of the Lord because it's born out of ultimate truth. Because God's name, it tells you who he is. It's a forever name. Because the, the force that could cause creation and cause light to spring forth there in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, it, it, all things come from that, and that name has no beginning or ending. Thus he is, I am. That covers all points. Covers all the wheres and whens of God's existence. I am. I am, as told to Moses in Exodus 3.14. Tell them that I am hath sent me Amen. to you. Is the divine name, it's ever expansive, for it does grow. Because just in the saying of I am, it incorporates this thought. I will be as I will be, and I will do as I will do. And I will speak as I will speak, and I will bring to pass that which will I bring to pass. And all that's contained within the divine name of the Almighty God. And thus could the name be delivered to Moses in Exodus 6.3 as going even beyond that of El Shaddai, God Almighty, the general designation to something very specific to the four letters of the divine name from which we get in English the name Jehovah, Jehovah God. So uh, thank the Lord. So he, there's a numbering to his name. And I, I believe, in, and we'll get to Psalms 136. At the first, I want to read from 1 Kings, if you want to turn there. But we'll come to Psalms 136. I believe that Psalms 136 does have purpose in the numbering of verses there, which, of course, the Bible wasn't written in chapter and verse. But there are plainly parts where uh, one sentence is meant to uh, stop and then another pick up after that. And so Psalms 136 divided into 26 parts. And I believe that's reflective of the divine name. For more of that, I refer you to last week's message for a little fuller explanation of that. But God has purpose in all that he does. His name means something. I am means something. That covers all things. El Shaddai, God Almighty, uh, he is that. God is good and he is almighty. He has no limit. And all the things that are set before us, it all has purpose in order to build up the spirit. So uh, we thank the Lord that, that God's name. In Revelation 3.12, the name of God gets an upgrade, so to speak, in order to reflect the glory of what has been done. Because there's a further stage of victory been met over the very gates of hell that John... And John saw the, all the vision of this upon Patmos. And uh, Brother Branham always maintained that was a facet of God's character that, uh, yes, he's changed his name many times. It's in the Conduct Order Doctrine books. It's question 338 uh, within the COD books, or the commonly called the question and the answer books. So he spoke to it quite a bit. So the name of God itself, it grows as further glory is added to it. And he came to us as Jesus of Nazareth, which name reflects that God is our salvation. What was Mary who prayed out there and 
Luke chapter 1 magnified the name of the Lord. Uh, she, what was she glad for? Mercy and the salvation thereof. And his mercy extends to us here below in forever terms. And truth, the ultimate truth that God is, truth is like mercy, it's just always there. We didn't invent it, mankind didn't invent these precepts. They were always there waiting to be explored and discovered because they are with God from the beginning. As God is the living personification through yeah. Jesus Christ our Lord, he's the living personification of truth that exists because it must exist. Because truth must exist. Just like if you add up one plus one equals two, there's a result there that's true. We didn't invent that. That was just, that was always there. It was eternal and the process that led us to that conclusion, it was always there. So there are things that are eternal and God is that internal truth that could express itself. So when we worship the Lord God, we are worshiping the spirit of truth itself because that's who God is. Truth that could give voice and bring forth things because truth had to be known, it had to be proclaimed. So even before the, uh, the high mountains and the low valleys, before the seas and the fountains abounding with water, before all those things, there was a process that brought us to this place. And that is who God is. So we thank the Lord for his mercy and that it lives within us. And without truth, there can be no God. But because there is truth, there is a creator, which is why God hates lies. You know why he hates lies? There's a lot of good answers to that. But lies do not, here's one of them, lies do not have life within them. And God is the author of life. He's the author of our salvation. Plus lies have a beginning and they have an ending. Truth has no beginning, has no ending. It was always there. Lies are temporal, they'll pass away. But the word of truth, it abides forever. And lies are also selfish. They're always self-centered. There's something self-centered behind every uh, falsehood ever uttered on the face of the earth. It's a desire to do for oneself and not for others. So it's selfish as well as being deceptive because lies bring death and the Lord cannot, will not have it. There's a struggle to get to that place of ultimate truth. We have to go through these things. We're on the road that leads to that goal in order to bring about this, that anything false has no place. So we're worshiping ultimate truth in a person and God is that person. And thus it is that the final victory over the last enemy is proclaimed, which is over death itself. Death is a lie that has to be taken out of the way. It's necessary, God lets it exist for a time, but it's gonna be swept away. And then the eternal will take hold. And the light is here, and we can right now walk in that light even as he is in the light, knowing that we have an eternal creation within us. And that is cause for great joy. That gives us cause to magnify the name of the Lord together. So soon, uh, since truth exists, God exists, found in the wisdom of Proverbs chapter eight, a uh, portion of scripture that's become uh, so much more precious to me as the years have gone on. You grow in the Lord, you learn these things, and you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Within that, in uh, Proverbs chapter 9, in the building of the house of seven pillars, the house of God's wisdom, because God exists, we exist, and truth is the reason for life itself. And there is no separate truth apart from God. It's all contained within his person. They are one, as God is the voice of truth. In 1 Kings chapter 21, as God is so many things, so many crowns adorn the one God of our salvation. God is light, God is love, God is truth. Amen. He is the way and the life. And there is nothing else anywhere. There's no other way to go. There's no other eternal truth anywhere else. There's no other mercy that endures except uh, that is his. And before we make our way back to Psalms 136, let's just take a look in 1 Kings 21 here. 
take a look at one of the most outstanding examples of mercy is we've got foundations, everything that's in the New Testament within the red letter sayings of Jesus. It has foundations in the Old Testament in order to form up a double witness that out of the mouth are two or three witnesses. Let everything be established as according to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 16. These things are founded upon the word of God. And the types and examples are given there as to show us the way and to show us how God works through the ages. So many of those things as they're all reflective of the attributes and the nature of the almighty God. So here we'll look at one of those things, and it comes to, God's mercy comes to one who, frankly, seems to deserve it the very least, because our subject matter, by way of a person, is Ahab, king of Israel, and Elijah prophesies against Ahab, the prophecy set in place in order to cut him off from the land of the living because of the actions undertaken in the earlier portions of the scripture, just to allude to that briefly. Uh, Jezebel got herself into it and they robbed a man, murdered a man in order to gain possession of his vineyard and uh, all those things. And you can read about that in the earlier portions of 1 Kings 21, which brings us here to verse 17. Those actions would have repercussions. If you sow the wind, what do you reap? You reap the whirlwind. All right, verse 17. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, uh, that was his place of origin, from the village of Tishba, which was in the uh, northern reaches of the possession of the children of Israel. It's in, uh, roughly uh, within the borders of what we would call Jordan uh, in, uh, in the modern world map. But from that, from that area, Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it, which all those things are contained in the earlier portion of scriptures. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? Because there's a long history of conflict between those two. Uh, politics and the gospel of Jesus Christ have never gotten along too well in this world. Uh, they are not a mix. They're not a match for one another. You'll, you'll love one and hate the other in the end. I've made my choice on that one. Amen. That, those choices are all set before us. Have you found me, mine enemy? He didn't expect Elijah to do anything good now that he, he was there. And Elijah answers, second part of the verse. And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of of the Lord, and then goes on. I'll bring evil upon you. So all these things. Of course, Ahab was husband to the infamous Queen Jezebel. So these things have foundations in the shadows and types of Scripture. God knows what's upcoming, so He sets patterns within Scripture because it pleases His divine will to show the manner of the things that will come to pass. And with Jezebel into the mix, it's foundational to what we read out of Revelation 2.20. In uh, the woman who calls herself uh, Jezebel, she calls herself a, a prophetess. And, and all the influences that came in to ingratiate itself amongst uh, the early church. So uh, following these things, following Jezebel's plot to steal Naboth's vineyard, Elijah has come to the king. So within the reading of these scriptures, especially note the judgment upon Ahab, king of Israel and Samaria, because this will lead to something very important for us to understand. Choices matter. We need to understand that. Choices matter. What you decide will determine the course of the way things will go. And even for the chiefest of sinners, it'll teach us this as we come to it, a little repentance goes a very long way with the Almighty because what? His mercy endures forever. And even though the judgments upon foreign kings such as it was in, 
in the days of the Exodus and such as are recounted in Psalms 136, there's a flip side to that because it's mercy upon the children of Israel because of their persecutors and their opponents. So what's judgment for one is mercy for another. But God desires mercy and his mercy, it endures forever. So within these things, a little mercy goes a long way and choices matter. As so told to Esther, the queen by Mordecai, her uncle, in the book of Esther, chapter 4 and verse 14, what you choose will shape your destiny. Because enlargement and deliverance, if you choose not to be a part of it, it'll come from some other corner. It'll come from some other place through some other people. And you'll be left out of it, but God will deliver. He will perform his word, whatever it is that people choose. So you have to choose your destiny according to the word of the Lord. Stay within it because God is a refiner's fire. He will try. He will try you in order to purify. And that's a, a, an ongoing action that we undergo in this life. And in the instance of Esther, she had to choose courageously to be part of that enlargement and deliverance. Just a, just like Mary had a choice. She had a choice. She could have not received uh, the blessing that she was accorded. It, but uh, thank the Lord. She magnified the name of the Lord. She was a willing participant in it. You've looked upon the low estate of thine handmaid, and you've chosen to bless Israel. Let's magnify the name of the Lord together. Amen. Thank the Lord. So uh, being, you have to choose to be part of these things. In Esther's case, or else she'd be left out. And salvation would have to come from some other corner. But it will come. It will come. And in this matter, we'll see the result of a choice made by Ahab and how it will affect things. As the pronouncement would come against the worst of the worst. For Ahab, there was no worst. There were some very terrible kings of Israel and Judah of which Ahab was right at the top of the list, being influenced by his wife Jezebel, a, a foreigner, and brought the Baal worship in, and, and she certainly loved her religion and was certainly one of the worst of a bad uh, lot of kings and a pairing of kings and queens in the history of Samaria, and uh, Judah ruled in Jerusalem. But can God show mercy to such a one as Ahab? Now that's quite a question. We'll answer it here in 1 Kings, same chapter, chapter 21. As Ahab would continue in his course, eventually to the point of this, who will persuade Ahab to go up to Ramoth-Gilead? As uh, his life story unfolds in, in, in the further scriptures as you go on to read them, and a lying spirit would volunteer for the job in chapter 22. But nonetheless, can God's mercy show to even, see to a person like that, we'll read it here in a moment, God's mercy extends so far. It extends into the forever time. God's mercy endures forever. All right, so sentence is passed on Ahab, and then we come to 1 Kings 21 and read from verse 25. But there was none like unto Ahab which did sell, him, sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. And when you go through all the history, we're reading a little portion of it, but that was certainly so. Verse 26, And he did very abominably, rather, in following idols, according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard these words, remember the admonishing words, we just read them a few moments ago, Elijah giving the prophecy of those things which would come to pass on Ahab. When Ahab heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly or carefully. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil 
upon his house. Even to somebody as terrible as Ahab, what does God always desire? He always desires mercy. A little, just a, a little sliver of repentance, a little sliver of awareness like that, and God turned aside destruction. Not to just punish the next generation who had, didn't have a hand in any of these things, but they would go in like ways, the ways of Ahab and Jezebel, so thus judgment would come, because God is a, a deliverer of justice. All right, so the sentence passed upon Ahab, but yet he found mercy. Just a little bit of repentance. Much like the city of Nineveh, remember, in the days of Jonah the prophet, everybody remembers the big fish, but the overriding precept of the book of Jonah is God's mercy. There at the city gates of Nineveh, capital of the old Assyrian Empire, God's mercy came. So at least for the moment, Ahab turned aside from his evil ways. And God, he desires mercy. And he made a choice that changed things. Do choices matter? Yes, they most certainly do. They absolutely do. But God's prophecies will come forth according to his will. But do choices matter? It makes a big difference. So we have to set our choices on high. You can alter the future. You can set matters on a different heading. Uh, in a subject I preached back in April, uh, uh, the higher ground message, I used the example of Brother Branham when he was in Africa, how he came to the point if he'd done one thing way, God was going to give him the whole country. Now his ministry there still did have a great effect, has effect even to this day. But nonetheless, things did not go accordingly, made choices because of the pressures he was under. He was a human being like everybody else. And things did not go perfectly as the Lord would have had it to, gone, to have gone. But nonetheless, and Brother Branham got sick, almost died and, and suffered from a result of that. But all things will come together, no matter what choices people make, the will of the Lord will be done and choices matter. And for such a Reasons does the fire of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13. It tries every man's work, but yet the soul can be saved. Because God's mercy, it endures forever. What boundless grace. What incredible love God has toward us. As the writer of 1 Corinthians, which was of course Paul, the apostle, he could tell you how great that is, for he once persecuted the church and mercy came to him. He got turned aside. Mercy always rejoices, even when it just comes up a little bit of humbleness, just a little bit. If there's something in there that has some eternal value, God can use that and things can change. A little repentance, a little repentance. It can change the course of history. And here it does here. But yet, the Revel book of Revelation remains in place. That's always one of the great amazements of Scripture to me. No matter what people choose, it all comes out the same way. The choices matter, but in the end, this is what will happen, and that will be, which is evidence of the Lord's omnipotence and of his transcendence even over the element of time itself. It's, it's just one of those amazements of the Scripture. You just have to look at it and say, glory to God. Amen. That's marvelous. It's marvelous in our eyes. But a little bit of repentance... God can show mercy just for that little speck, just that little moment of time, just a little repentance. That's one of the keys to the kingdom. Remember, Peter delivered there in Acts 2.38. Jesus gave to him the keys to the kingdom, repentance and baptism. Repentance gets you to the throne of grace and then identification with him. It seals you in as one of the servants of God so that we can truly say, oh, I'm glad I'm one of them. I'm glad to be part of that. I'm part, glad to be part of the family of faith. And Ahab's uh, repentance, it didn't go near far enough to be in God's perfect will. It never reached a level uh, that high. But it still shows to us God's will, doesn't it? Through these merciful examples that we have, God's will and his nature and his desire toward us, it shows in these examples. Now let's turn to Psalms 136. Let's return unto the Lord, which is what repentance does. It returns to the Lord. 
And let's return to this psalm, the grace of the psalm that proclaims his mercy 26 times over. Psalms 136, the ancient pathways are still the best. The, the Bible and the precepts, they've never been improved upon. Nobody's come up with a better plan. There is no other way. This is the way, the truth and the life. The ancient pathways lead us to the Savior that God established, and then they proceed from the eternal wisdom that was there before creation came into being. All right, last week we read the first three verses of Psalms 136. We'll pick it up. At verse 4, the first three verses, deliver the thanks to Almighty God. Be thankful in all that you do. Yeah. Be thankful that we have these scriptures to read. Psalms 136, we pick it up at verse 4. To him who alone doeth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. And it did. His wisdom made the heavens. There's mathematical equations in all of the universe. It, it runs by mathematics. And who's the great mathematician who made all that math work? That's the one we worship, the Holy One of Israel, who brought it forth. Here, the Bible knew that. The Bible knew that by wisdom he created the heavens. The, the Bible's known about these things from forever. These are forever eternal truths. Whatever man discovers is just something God put in place a long time before we ever got here. So uh, there in the beginning, wisdom made all these things. What was God's companion there before creation? It was wisdom. I was there, Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 27. I was there. I was daily his delight. I was there with him in all these acts of creation. I'm crying out to you, the first verse of Proverbs chapter 8. I'm speaking to you. This is the wisdom that's reaching right out of these scriptures that endures forever and it's speaking to you right now. In order to get a hold of your heart, to get a hold of your spirit, to get you firmly founded in the truth that ever was and ever will be. And in the simplicity and the openness of this statement the, uh, uh, that we read in verse 4 and verse 5, all the origins of creation were formed out of that. What you need to know about creation and how we all got here and what we're doing here and who am I and what's my purpose in life and what's it all mean, it's all contained within these verses. Understanding has put forth her voice. In the great wonders of the creative acts, the same wisdom that measured out the cosmos, it's the same wisdom that did that that measured out the wisdom that decided that mercy was the greater precept. That was the most valuable thing. The same wisdom that held the measuring line in its hands in Job chapter 38 and verse 5 and did all the math in order to call the universe forth, that same eternal, boundless vision, knows no barriers, saw mercy as an eternal truth. And there can be no true judgment without mercy. So God came to give us what? Mercy. He gave mercy to us. It endures forever because it's made up of eternal stuff. It doesn't have physical properties. It exists outside of that. Mercy is an eternal truth. It always was, always will be. And of course, at the same time, speaking of mercy and judgment together at the same time, there can be no true equity, equalness, balance of judgment without passing sentence upon evil works, and, and God will do that. God will do that. That which has no eternal value, it's going to go away. And vengeance does belong to the Lord. It's his. I will repay, saith the Lord. So we'll be there and sit as judges along with the great judge of all the earth. And those things take patience. It takes a lot, of, it takes a lot to make it through this world, get to where we're going to be. Remember the souls under the altar in the book of Revelation in the fifth seal? Souls under the altar. Just hold on. Have patience. They're given white robes. Old people of Old Testament faith. They didn't have the white robes, but they're given them. You know, you can put those white robes on right now. Right now, while we're here in the land of the living. Put these verses on. 
Put on garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Put them on right now. Amen. You can be wearing them when you get there. Amen. But thank the Lord for his mercy. They didn't have white robes, but they're given them and they're told to have patience for these things to play themselves out. God's mercy, what does it do? It endures forever. It's yea and amen. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. In the Gospels, Matthew chapter 6, comparative verses, we're taking mercy as the centerpiece of our uh, instruction today. As Matthew chapter 6 will contain the Lord's Prayer, we're going to read that. While we're pointing towards verses 14 and 15 that follow on the heels of the model for all righteous prayer, and as we read out of Matthew chapter 6, as we read the Lord's Prayer, you can, when we come to it here, you can quote it along with me. As a matter of fact, let's do that. Let's recite the Lord's Prayer as we read it. As we partake of it together, as we take in the words of the Master, from Matthew chapter 6, the ninth verse, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that's, that's merciful. That's God's merciful kindness that delivered to us such words. Just in a few words. It, it only took, I didn't time it, it took about 30 seconds to say that. Greatest prayer ever given. Just the, the, all the things of God that are contained within the words that Jesus spoke. And then from verse 14 and 15, I'll just read them myself, of course. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. In a word, that's what? That's mercy. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Don't forget the basics. Got to stay in tune with God's word, these foundation principles. All prophetic word depends on these principles. Without the love of God, love one another, we can't be who we are. It, it would all uh, go away. Uh, the principles wouldn't hold up. Jesus would have had to come off the cross, call 12 legion of angels, destroy the world and set him free were it not for the principles of mercy. And the things we read like within, with King Ahab and many other uh, scriptures also, Without an Old Testament example of the willingness to forgive, of which there are many, from what standpoint would Jesus have had the right to proclaim words like this? Had to have a foundation. They are there within Scripture. Examples of God's mercy like unto Ahab, the Exodus generation was sure one. God was ready to consume them in a moment. Moses interceded on their behalf, and that thing pleased the Lord, and he stayed his hand of judgment. Or the aforementioned, uh, we cited the example of Nineveh in Jonah's day. The destruction that was coming, God set it aside because there was just a little bit of repentance. And it shows in his e e example right down unto our own day. God does wonders. God's mercy, oh, that is a wonder. Amongst the wonders that he does. His wisdom alone, it did make the heavens, as we read out of the fourth and fifth verse of Psalms 136. That same wisdom that did all that, created the universe, perceived that love is unsurpassed as a virtue. Amen. And because the Lord, he loved us, Jesus delivered mercy on the cross. He delivered mercy there, the emblem of suffering and shame. But now it's our great hope. And we take the cross upon ourselves and identify with Christ as a matter of our faith, whereas before it was a symbol of the curse of the law. So God calls us to many circumstances. In order, sometimes, yes, he'll break you down, but it's always to build you back up and do a vessel that's meet for use. It all has purpose. It all has meaning. And this has to get through to our spirit in order to make a 
difference in this world and to choose the right way. We are to be a people of the heart. The new covenant was always coming. That's Jeremiah chapter 31. There was something coming that was better than just a, a listing of rules, but they were foundations for all the things that Jesus said. But that's what delivers a kingdom. After all, Jesus did say this, the kingdom of God is within you. So if somebody says it's in a place or it's here or, or it's there, don't believe it. The kingdom of God is within you. It lives within his, the praises of his people. Where does God inhabit? He inhabits the praises of his people. That's non-physical. God dwells in a place that doesn't have physical substance the way that we know it. He created all these things, but he dwells with faith. He dwells in mercy, and he inhabits the praises of his people. So that has to uh, be within our spirit. And all else needs to be swept aside so that the kingdom alone remains within our heart. And all things that come against that, they're, you know, there's so much in this world. Gender differences, political strife, uh, prejudices, superiority complexes or inferiority complexes, uh, all, all these types of things, we have to get them out of the way in Jesus' name. Rely upon his mercy so that nothing hinders us from the glory which is in Christ Jesus. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, just right after the Psalms of Praise, Proverbs chapter 3, all these layers of faith by which revelation is imparted, they speak of that which God values the most. So when Jesus told his critics there in the New Testament era, he said, Moses wrote of me, it wasn't just that he would be, as Moses imparted to the people then, God will raise up a prophet like unto me. That's part of it that led to Christ. But in every line, in everything that was delivered upon Mount Sinai and throughout all the law, through these Old Testament examples, through the prophets, we see the nature of the Almighty God. I mean, and God prizes mercy, for mercy always dwells within the component, as a component, rather, of love. So, uh, so thank the Lord. Amen. Now, remember we read out of Psalms 136, in verse 5, it said, Wisdom made the heavens above. We'll access a little bit of that in Proverbs chapter 3. And from verse 19, we read, The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. Because God's wisdom, his understanding, it's eternal. Amen. It endures forever. He decided that mercy had eternal value, and it does. It does. We live within that. All right, by wisdom he has founded all things. By understanding, established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths are broken up, and the clouds drop down the dew. My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet, because that gives us a confidence born of faith. Uh, yes, well, that doesn't mean you have a trouble-free existence, but when your hope's in the Lord, you're grounded and settled, and nothing can overturn that, which is why we sing a song that says, I reckon that the sufferings of this world... Yeah. They're not worthy to be compared to the glory which is to be revealed. That has to, that has to get into the heart and spirit. It has to become part of you. When that becomes real, you're glad for it. Because then when you're mad about something, it'll last five minutes instead of five hours. Or whatever portion, God knows we're human, we can express ourselves in all these things. And uh, we all have tempers, and we, all, we can all be impatient at times. But when your confidence and hope is in the Lord, uh, those things, it'll, it'll narrow the gap. It'll get things down to, to where you can bridge that gap. Because, oh, what a mighty span uh, that God did there at Calvary. Over that gulf of sin and, and those things, what, what a mighty work God did. He spanned that bridge. 
that mighty gulf at Calvary. So thank the Lord for his eternal presence, as there's just depth in the simplicity of these statements written within in order to soothe the conscience, to give us meaning for all things, that all our labor is not in, in vain in the Lord. And never underestimate the Proverbs. To the uninitiated, it just looks like a collection of bumper sticker sayings or something like that, or t-shirt slogans. Oh, there's depth in the Proverbs, that you've got to sink your spiritual teeth into it. It has the entire history of God's wisdom contained there, and why we got here, and who God is. The very first deductions and assessments that are eternal to the Almighty God, El Shaddai, they're contained within the book of Proverbs. In, sim in simplistic form that we can understand it, but yet so profound in the effect because the wisdom that stretched out the heavens like a curtain is also the wisdom that said his mercy. It has no beginning to it, and it has no end. It endures forever, and it's here. It's here right now. It could even show in the life of Ahab, who would look like the last person on earth that would deserve any mercy, but God showed him some there, just for that little corner of time. Didn't make him perfect, not by a long shot, but God could show just a little bit of mercy. And what did Jesus do upon the cross? Who'd he died for after all? It was the sinner and the ungodly, right? God didn't come to save the righteous. He came to save the sinner and the ungodly. So that's all foundational to those things. It runs throughout the course of our recorded history that we have in this book of our Bible. Amen. It endures. It endures always. It's his mercy that we live. He pulled us out of the darkness of non-existence and brought us into his marvelous light. That's mercy. And it takes a lifetime of patience in order to seek these things out. As all things were made by him, and, that, and you start there, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Why does it start there? Because that's where his mercy toward us started. The concept was there, but then he brought it all forth, and he redeemed us and gave himself for us. And it's the greatest story ever told. It's marvelous, no matter how much we speak to it or, or, or praise him for it. There's always cause to give him more glory. There's always cause to magnify his name even further. Because the limits of his mercy, are, they're, they're boundless. It's like the nature of Almighty God himself. It knows no boundaries. And the learning of revelation never stops moving in your life if you choose that to be so. And so, again, choices matter. Choices matter a great deal. And when you learn new things or you receive new inspiration, you get a new song, a new thought occurs, and the spiritual light bulb goes on above the head. Doesn't it make you feel young again? Doesn't it put the, the heart of the Almighty God right within your spirit? Now, take that feeling and multiply it a hundred million times, and you get an idea of what eternity is like. Amen. God's blessings are limitless. They make you feel eternal. Look at there. Uh, I see the light. No more in darkness. Amen. Thank the Lord. The light of God shows. All right, let's return to Psalms 136. We'll finish up with our portion of Scripture there. As we're taking the whole chapter's foundational, part three will be the pulpit service, and there's a part four here. Uh, Upcoming, Psalms 136, Christ came to deliver holiness by eternal truths. Instead of killing and murder, which reared its ugly head following the expulsion from Eden, God came to deliver mercy. Jesus delivered the thought to put away anger. That's what God desires for us. Instead of unfaithfulness, to not let the lusts of the flesh rule, instead of separation from the Almighty God, rather to seek commitment, which rules relationships of all kinds, instead of swearing by an oath, rather just speak truth. That's the wisdom of Almighty God. That's the nature in which he brings things forth. He delivered this, instead of retribu retribution, seek forgiveness. It shows in the instance that we read about Ahab. 
in place of hatred, go even this far. Love thine enemies. And without that saying, you wouldn't have the example of the Matthew 8 centurion because he was the enemy. He was a soldier of Rome serving Caesar upon his throne. But nonetheless, in his life experience, he learned what authority was, and he had love within his house. He'd built for them a synagogue and so forth. Faith began to stir, and he'd reached this level that said, speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed, because I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. You should even come under my roof. Stop Jesus right in his tracks. Now, that's the kind of faith Jesus came to look for, and it, it stopped him right there. Oh, if you could see the look on his face, if you could be there to witness that. Stopped him right in his tracks. I haven't found faith like this. Not in Israel. And they had all the advantages. They had the law and the prophets. And here was this Gentile man with just a cursory knowledge of the faith of Abraham uh, according to the days of his service to Rome and so forth. And you get a saying out there. So love thine enemies because uh, in and amongst them God's mercy will show just like it did to one lone Roman centurion. And these things show depth of spirit that the law, law of Moses couldn't regulate. The law was just and it was holy and it was true. But we needed more. We needed more than just the mere keeping of rules. But the law did teach us things and it got us to Christ, which is what it was designed to do. The schoolmaster, the truant officer, so to speak, went along with us until we could get to the actual teacher, the very teacher of righteousness, the very messenger of the covenant. All right, so the choices you make for the Lord, do they matter? Oh, they're of eternal value. Uh, they ring down through the corridors of time to the time when time itself shall be no more. Psalms 136 at verse 6 now. If you want to endure forever yourself, you've got to be fully invested in eternal attributes. Within God's mercy, there are those who can come to life under uh, the authority of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15. But you, you're, you're spinning the, the wheel of fortune there. You, we rely on God's mercy, but you have, to, you have to come to a place of judgment. Don't do that. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Right. Don't put him in that place. But we thank God it exists. Some can come to life. That's how merciful God's nature is. But far better is it to obey. Right. Obedience is better than any sacrifice you can do. To listen to the word of the Lord, it's better than all the sacrifices of thousands of rams. It's better than all those things. You can put on the white robes right now. You can put them on while you're in the land of the living. You can identify yourself with the name of Christ and be baptized in his name right now according to the word of the Lord. Here in Psalms 136, we're down to verse 6. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endureth forever. Is this section, this portion of scriptures, it emphasizes the regal authority of rule. As God put in place that which runs our lives day and night, the, the system that we have of the sun, moon, the ordinance of the stars, that which uh, orders our day-to-day -day world, gives us 24-hour days, all these things. God has set it in place. And all our substance is directed toward the Most High, who gave us the most. Yes. You should love the one who gave you the most, right? Amen. God gave you life. God gave you everything. Amen. He gave us a place to live there in verse 6 in order that we would have a, a point of origin and reach even higher heights. So if you ever want to doubt God's mercy, take a look up in the sky. Look at the sun. Look at the moon. Uh, consider the earth going through its orbit, which Job said that he's hung the earth upon nothing. There it is, but yet it's here to sustain life. There's order to the universe. It's, it's put in place. Uh, God has ordained these things to give us a place to live and to draw a blessing 
from him. So if you ever doubt, just look up in the sky. That's God's mercy and evidence of it. How could we ever appreciate heaven above without the experience that we go through on earth below? He measured it. He built it for just that purpose. That's why it's here. It's why we're here. As the one sun of our sky, it represents the oneness of his being as the true source of life. The heavens above, they declare the glory of God. Make, make no mistake about it. And the moon in this case stands for his reflected glory that shines in us through the darkness. And the stars, there's your blessings. It's like as Abraham, look out and count the stars, so shall your blessings be. Which shows us who God is through his mercy that endures forever. And he rules our lives. We use the sun and the moon to go by for calendar years and months and days. But who rules them? <laughs> who rules this? God rules them. Amen. God has set them in place in order to bless us. How great is that? Yeah. Indeed, how great is our God? Let's stand and pray. We're going to sing that chorus following prayer of dismissal. How great is our God? How great is his word? Amen. Brothers and sisters may come forward as they will. Thank the Lord for his mercy. It made us. Yes, By grace are you saved and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. That's God's benevolent mercy that shows forth. And it truly is great. It's precious to us. The sum of all wisdom and knowledge and strength and mercy is contained within his word. It's a wonder to behold. It speaks of itself. It speaks of how great it is through the verses that correspond one with another, that speak to each other in the line upon line, precept upon precept, faith that was once delivered to the saints. We learn of his holy will through these things, and it adds up to greatness in Jesus' name. So we just thank the Lord for that which we are partaking of this day as we bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, knowing that the greatness of your word, the greatness of your wisdom is contained within these precepts that you have given us, things that we can understand, things that we can take a hold of. As you've taken the eternal wisdom and put it into scriptures and into parables and into sayings that speak to us of all the great and mighty things, the precious things of salvation that we read of. And all the answers are contained within. If we will but turn with eyes of faith toward your word, Father, it'll deliver us out of the depths, the depths of whatever trial of transgression comes forth. Father, all these things can be defeated in Jesus' name. Even unto that last enemy, even death itself, your mercy endures forever, and it'll be done with one day. In that glad day when all other powers are put down, and your light rules the universe of our being. Father, hasten that day, yet not according to my will, but for the glory of your name and for the glory of your will. Even so come, Lord Jesus, Father, we pray for that blessed moment. Father, we thank you for all the great and precious promises that are forever promises in your name. How great they are, how precious is the sum of them to us. Father, through the blessed name of Jesus, we praise you and eternally so. Amen and amen. Well, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for his precious word. It's heaven sent. It's life to us. How great is our God.
is past and then it's homeward bound I'm going home and I will fly just like an eagle to God's throne I hear my father calling me I can't slip from his hands I'll never feed on carry on fresh meat my soul demands act in the spirit of mercy and grace showing God you're happy to be in his perfect place Resisting the enemy and holding faith fast. Thanking God for victory until this life is past. And it's homeward bound, I'm going home. And I will fly just like an eagle to God's throne. I hear my father calling me, I can't slip from his hands. I'll never feed on, carry on, first meet my soul demands. Act in the spirit of mercy and grace showing God you're happy to be in his perfect place resisting the enemy and holding faith fast thanking God for victory until this life is past use eyes of faith and prophecy 